It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this 18th annual EWTN Catholic Radio Conference. It's so good to have you with us here in Birmingham once again. Uh, so many friends who've been here for a number of years, many of you uh, dating back to uh, the first of those radio conferences. Um, so it's always wonderful to be able to have uh, our old friends uh, join us once again. But it's also exciting to meet some new folks and to have some people who are just in the very beginning stages of their Catholic radio adventure with us. And so if it's your first time here or your 18th time here, uh, we are so, so happy that you've chosen to spend these days uh, here with us and with your EWTN radio family. You know, the call to be involved in Catholic radio is a serious commitment. It's a serious commitment. And it's not always easy, as those who've been uh, doing this for quite a while can tell you. But God has called you in a very, very specific way at this time to be involved in Catholic radio. Mother Angelica once said that it doesn't matter whether you're five or 105. God has called you for a specific purpose in this time and place to do his will. Don't miss the opportunity to say yes to that call. You've done that. You've done that in so many ways, even by being here today to be a part of this conference. The mission of Catholic Radio is more important than ever, I'm convinced. And we've heard ever since the first days of Pope Francis's pontificate, we've heard him call us as a church to reach out to the peripheries, to go to the peripheries. I can think of no better way to reach those peripheries, be they geographic or spiritual, than Catholic Radio. Catholic Radio is a unique apostolate that has the ability to touch people in the silence of their, their cars, in that solitude, in, in the moment of their life when they most need to hear the message of the gospel and a word of hope. That is what we together as a Catholic radio family do day in and day out. That's what you've been called to do and that's the call that you've accepted. And so I welcome you here today with your Catholic radio family that we can learn from one another, that we can support one another, and we can continue on the path of reaching out to those peripheries, of touching lives, and of saving souls. May God bless you for your faithfulness to this cause, and thank you for being with us today. Where's Dr. Ray? Ray, hey, Ray! You're supposed to be here! Howdy, Father! Shut up! Get over here! Where are you? Hey, Tompkin! Come on! I'm gonna be late! You're already late! Tompkin, I need to get there real fast! Yeah, I'll go after a you little You got any kid. shortcuts? Sure do, Dr. Ray! Yikes! All Scary. the way up there? Yep! Does he look old? And, and no elevator? Unfortunately. Radio conference, here we come. Let's do this, cowboy. To the top. To the It's like oh, an 80, for oh. goodness sakes. Hey, Blaze, a little help here, buddy? Come on, Blaze, faster, buddy. Let's go. We made it, guys. And with 15 seconds to spare, I couldn't have done it without you. Thanks, though. You're welcome, Dr. Ray. Hey, come on. Goodbye. Goodbye. See you later, guys. Hurry up. I love those two. Mm. Come on. Conference. We're back. Are you excited? I don't think so. Dr. Ray says you're worse than a night crowd. You know, it's kind of like they're dead. Sorry. You want to say anything? Yeah. What are you going to say? A lot of Italians here. No. And priests. 
Not that you many. remember when you like were doing us. that marriage thing for the guys? My uncle Giuseppe was there. Was that was his name? Yeah, really? Giuseppe, Uncle Giuseppe. You went and lie. You know, oh. No, he had been married 48 years. Wow. So the priest says to Giuseppe, Giuseppe, will you tell these young men how to make a marriage last 48 years? Well, you got to be nice. You got to do good things, make yeah. her feel very special. Oh. For our 25th anniversary, I take her to Italy. The priest says, Giuseppe, that's very nice. Very nice. Two more years? 50. Wow. What will you do then? Oh, for my 50, I'm going to go get her and bring her back. <laughs> oh. Have you ever heard? <laughs> That's just bad. You know, but while we were talking about it, I remember, I'm sure you heard, you know, Dr. Ray was a young boy once. Did you know that? And he came from I a had big a family. had a mustache at four. had a mustache at three is what it was. But anyway. My sister had one at two. <laughs> she still does. Anyway, what happened was it was terrible. <laughs> he wanted a bicycle. You know, he's always wanted things. He's a very persistent type person. Anytime I ever want, I'm supposed to do anything. He calls the head of my foundation and he says, I talked to Mary Therese. I got what I wanted. He didn't talk to me. I talked to Mary Therese. He always goes to the women. So anyway, when he was young, he wanted a bike. So he went to his mother and says, Mommy, 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 can I have a bicycle? No, you cannot have a bicycle. And he, you know how persistent Ray can be. Mommy, 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 please, can I have a bicycle? I told you no. Mommy, 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 I need a bicycle. I want to go see my friends. This one guy talks to me, and I don't have to pay him. Please, can I have a bicycle? She says, I, we don't have the money. We can't do it. You go, and you ask Jesus for a bicycle. And so he sat down, and he goes, okay, I will. And he went, and he sat at his desk in his room, and he said, dear Jesus, if you get me a bicycle, I will be nice to my sister for the rest of the week. And he goes, no, he went and threw it away. Okay. Dear Jesus, if you get me a bicycle, I will do the dishes for my mother. Oh, no. And then he thought, and he goes, I know. And he went up into his mother's room, and there was a beautiful statue of Our Lady of Grace. And he took the bedspread off the, the bed, and he threw it over our statue of Our Lady of Grace, came downstairs, and threw it under his bed. And he said, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again... <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. That's very true. I, I, I remember. I was very true. Yeah, did you know? <laughs> I guess it is. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We launched on Divine Mercy Sunday, uh, May 1st, 2011. I'm Cindy Dorsey. I'm the general manager of a couple of the stations up there in Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, I'm nobody special. Um, I'm just a sinner. Um, which I wasn't before I met Dr. Ray. <laughs> I, I just want to give one message out to you, and that is that we are all driving the bus of life. We think we're the drivers, and God's sitting in the back, and he's saying, when you hit a bump in the road, I'm going to help you out. Are you kidding me? We're not the drivers. God is. It's our job to let God drive the bus and take us where we need to, to keep Catholic Radio going, to join with all of the angels in proclaiming the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we'll all continue to do. And I thank you all for being partners in crime with me in this mission. One of the great things about this event each year is that we also get to recognize affiliates uh, who have been part of the EWTN family for milestone years. And so we have uh, several of our affiliates that we want to recognize uh, this evening. And first, we want to recognize a five-year affiliate. Uh, and so I'm happy to recognize St. Paul Catholic Radio of Augusta, Georgia, on their fifth anniversary as an EWTN affiliate. <laughs> and accepting on their behalf is Dean Weber. Dean. Thank, thank you so much for um, praising the Lord and blessing the Lord and, and evangelizing for the Lord. And we all we all in this together and thank you for your, our, your, our, your stations. God bless you. We also this evening wish to recognize another affiliate that has been a part of the EWTN radio family for 10 years, 
And so we're happy to acknowledge and recognize Prince of Peace Catholic Radio of Vero Beach, Florida. And accepting on their behalf this evening is Bob Grokey. I know uh, if Ron, the faithful servant that he is, was here, he would likely thank EWTN for the great services and support that made I know his tenure possible. God bless you all. Thank you. One of the things that led me to the Catholic faith, I, was, I grew up Protestant, and of course, little Protestant kids grew up on the Chronicles of Narnia and C.S. Lewis. Wheaton College, where I graduated, we used to call C.S. Lewis the patron saint of Wheaton College. And I always thought it was supremely ironic, because he was a man whose sensibilities were Catholic, even though his prejudices were typically Northern Irish Protestant. If you read enough Lewis, he'll bring you right to the edge of the Catholic faith, you know. And, um, and so I often say that one of the, the first Catholic to kind of read me into the faith was, was C.S. Lewis himself, who never quite made the journey. And then when I became Catholic, it wasn't intentional, came in on uh, November the 16th, 2003, and about 10 years later, I was reading actually the Register, I think, and an article on uh, a real historical saint, St. Lucy of Narnia, who incidentally was in fact the inspiration for the character in Lewis's story. And I was absolutely thrilled to find out that I had come into the church, uh, church on the feast day of St. Lucy of Narnia. Um, so you may have heard it's a little bit of an accident that I'm speaking to you today. I, I didn't know until yesterday that I was going to give this keynote. <clears throat> and I said, well, you know, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I've only got about 20 hours to get ready, and I'm going to sleep for at least part of that. Um, so it's a bit of an accident. But you know what? It's a bit like everything I've ever done in Catholic radio, right? <laughs> So, so I've got a friend who lives in Pennsylvania, really smart guy. Uh, he's got a PhD in philosophy, and he just, he's a third-order Dominican, and he, he's a wonderful apologist and theologian. And he said to me one time, he said, so David, we, we were at a conference up in Steubenville. He says, so David, how do you get into this Catholic radio gig? You know, how do you, how do you host a radio show? And I said, okay, here's how you do it. First of all, you read your way into the faith, and then, and then you move totally by accident five miles away from the world's largest religious broadcaster, not knowing that it's there, right? Then you start going out there for confession, and the next thing you know, you join the choir and you start singing, and then you turn over and there's this nice woman next to you who happens to be married to the program director for the radio station. And okay, I get it, I get it, I see how that works, okay, that's not going to happen. It was a complete accident, okay? In fact, finding EWTN at all for me was a complete accident, okay? I grew up Protestant, very anti-Catholic, very anti-Catholic, and in fact, you know, went to college and seminary and studied Reformation theology, really in the hopes that I would win all these poor benighted Catholics back to the true faith of Presbyterianism. It didn't work out that way. And, uh, you know, of course, eventually I, I sort of realized that I was in the wrong church, and that was very uncomfortable. But I had to work through some of the kinks, some of the problems in the theology. And I had moved back to Birmingham to be near family, and uh, I had gotten about everything I could get out of books. You know, I'd answer, but I, I really needed some real flesh and blood living Catholics to talk through the stuff with, and I didn't know any. All right, because there are very few Catholics in Birmingham. We're only like 2% of the population. Growing up, all the Catholics I knew were ex Catholics. There were tons of them in our church. And you would ask people, So, did you grow up Christian? And they would say, Oh, no, I grew up a Catholic. <laughs> okay, very typical conversation. So I'm like, Where am I going to find these? Uh, I need people that have made the journey the other way, that have gone from Protestantism to Catholicism. Because I'd ask my Catholic buddies, you know, well, what do y'all do with Augustine's doctrine of predestination? And they'd look at me like I had two heads. You know, I needed a Presbyterian for whom those kind of questions really mattered. So I'm like, where am I going to find somebody that I can talk about this stuff with? And somehow or another, I learned about this guy named Marcus Grodi, all right, the Coming Home Network. I don't remember how I found him. I don't think I heard the radio show. I think I found him on the Internet. And so I call up the Coming Home Network, Grodi's Association, and I say, look, I'm living in Birmingham, Alabama. I need, I need some ex-Protestants who have become Catholic. Do you know any? 
I said, we know a few. <laughs> uh, do you know where EWTN is? I said, I've never heard of the place. Now, I, I grew up here my entire life. Actually, I had seen Mother Angelica's community before the television station started. Uh, there used to be a swimming club near the near EWTN campus in Irondale called the Mount Brook Swim and Tennis Club. And as a kid, I used to go there and swim and play tennis when I was a child. And I remember one time, it, it had to have been in the 80s, I don't remember when, driving down Old Leeds Road and, you know, I'm probably wearing tennis clothes and I look at it and I'm like, who are these strange people wearing odd clothing walking around in the front of this place? And they were nuns, of course, and I didn't know what they were. It's the only time I ever encountered EWTN. Actually, it wasn't EWTN back then. It was just, the, just her community. So I didn't know it was here. And he said, well, you got to go out there. Um, you know, we, we found somebody for you to talk to. So I went the completely wrong way. I, I went this very circuitous way, kind of all around the city of Birmingham, and came by the backside and eventually made it into EWTN. And, uh, and I, I met a, a guy named Gordon Sibley, who himself was an accidental convert to the Catholic faith, was a Methodist minister who made the big mistake of wandering into a Catholic bookstore one day. All right, and, and the rest was history. And so Gordon and I sat down in the St. Michael Hall, which I remember thinking was like terribly medieval, like these giant iron maidens everywhere that were these medieval confessionals, you know, kind of intimidating, which I eventually came to have my soul saved in those confessionals. But I remember thinking it was a bit odd and strange. We had a nice conversation. And uh, that was my first encounter with EW10. Totally accidental encounter. Wasn't looking for it, just kind of stumbled onto it in this very circuitous route. Well, of course, eventually... Um, I, after I became Catholic, all right, uh, my wife was not really excited about it. She had grown up cradle Catholic, not very engaged in the faith. Her first real engagement with Christianity was when I brought her into the Presbyterian Church, and I said to her one day, I think I need to become Catholic, and she said, first you lead me out of that church, now you want to lead me right back in, all right? Um, but she had kind of a difficulty with me going to confession. It kind of gave her a pain, so I looked for a place where I could go during the weekdays, and I couldn't make it on Saturdays, and so I said, that place with the giant Iron Maidens, you know, that, I, I'm going to go back out there to Irondale, so I start going back out to EWTN, uh, not to be on radio, but to get my soul saved and cleansed, okay? Um, so, you know, finding EWTN for me, finding Catholic Radio was totally accidental, um, and the way I came to the faith, of course, was totally accidental. I didn't, I didn't intend, I didn't set out to read my way into the Catholic Church. I found the Catholic faith in the mouth of of her detractors, Lutheran Calvin. John Calvin made me a Catholic, if you can believe that. G.K. Chesterton once said that he found the church that everyone knew to be infallibly wrong turned out to be the church that was infallibly right. All right, so I thought what I want to talk to you about a little bit today is this, this idea of the accident of Catholic radio, okay? Because what I've found is that everybody I've met in Catholic radio, almost nobody sets out intentionally to get involved in Catholic radio. Everybody's kind of here by accident, you know? Our Lord said in the, in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, he said about the most Catholic doctrine, right, the doctrine of the Eucharist, he says, no one comes to me, no one comes to me except the Father draw him. No one comes to me except the Father draw him. I, uh, I had the privilege, I guess about a year and a half ago, was it a year and a half, of being out in St. Louis with Tony Holman and the Covenant Radio Network, and I asked Tony, I said, how did, you, how did you get involved in Catholic radio? I thought it was very apt. He said, well, it, it really began in front of the tabernacle. It began in front of the tabernacle, spending time with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And he laid on my heart the call to evangelism. And how am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? Catholic radio kind of seemed the right avenue to go. He was, he was drawn. He was drawn. And all of us were drawn. We're called by the Lord to this ministry. St. Paul says it's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. This is not of yourselves, all right? I believe it's because of him that you are in Catholic Radio today. All right, so I want to just share with you a couple stories about the accident of Catholic Radio in people's lives. These are, exper these are stories from my own ministry, things that I've encountered on the radio. I think one of my favorite uh, engagements on Catholic Radio is with a man named Roy. I don't know Roy's last name, but Roy is a truck driver, so I just call him Roy the truck driver. And I know him, I feel like I know him well now because he's called back and forth over the months and years many, many times, and I've heard his story. So I remember first encountering Roy because he was flipping through Sirius Satellite Radio and he came across CWTN on Satellite Radio. He wasn't looking for it, it was an accident, and he said, You guys are nuts. You know, y'all worship Mary, you believe in purgatory, you do all this unbiblical stuff, I don't know what you're talking about. So we began a dialogue and we had a conversation. And then 
you know, a few months, didn't hear from him for a while. A few months later, Roy calls back, and he's still driving his truck, and he says, you know, this is getting more interesting to me, and I want to explore this. And he begins to ask sincere questions about the faith. And then, you know, about a few months later, he says, I, th I think I might want to enter RCA, but I have a problem. My problem is that I'm always on the road, and I can't stop and, and you know, be in one place long enough to actually consistently attend RCA. He said, Roy, it's not a problem. All we got to do is find you a deacon or a priest that will work with you privately will bring you in the faith that way. So he says, I'll go do it. And he calls back a couple weeks later, says, I got my deacon, all right? <laughs> and he works out where he's going to meet this guy, you know, once a month or whenever periodically. And then Roy calls back, you know, a, a few months later, says, you know, I've just been received into the church at Easter. I said, Roy, that's fantastic. And then he calls back again about six months later. And he says, I'll tell you what I've been doing. He says, I stop at the truck stops. And he says, all the truckers, they're either, they're either fundamentalists or they're immoral. All right, there are no Catholics. So, I'm, and so I've started evangelizing them. And I'm starting telling them about, you know, we don't really worship Mary and, and why we pray to the saints. And he starts giving out. I said, Roy, this is good apologetics you're giving me. We've got to get you on the radio, you know. And then, uh, and then, of course, he calls back about six months later. He says, well, now I'm having a problem. I have a difficulty. You know, this, this Catholic faith you've gotten me into, I, I realize that not everybody's perfect, and there, there are problems in the church, and I want to figure out how to assimilate this and make sense of it in my spirituality. And, he, and, and of course, the, the, the dialogue has continued through the years. So he started totally opposed to the Catholic faith, and the next thing I know, he's evangelizing truckers on the road. Totally accidental. I'll tell you another accidental story about Catholic radio. Um, I, uh, I had the privilege several years ago of being with Barbara McWiggan on her show, The Good Fight, and she invited my wife also to come on the show and for us to share our story and talk about our faith. And uh, my wife does not like public speaking. She doesn't like to be up in front of people, and she was very uncomfortable with the experience. And, uh, and when we got done, we got off the air, and she turned to me and she said, that was terrible. I don't ever want to do that again. Don't ever put me on the radio. I don't, I don't want to be there. It was awful. I said, well, you, it really wasn't awful. You did fine. She says, no, I, I couldn't stand it. I don't want to do it again. I said, okay, no problem. About two years go by, and I get an email from a guy, and he says, my name is Brother David, and I'm a Melkite monk, and I live on a tower outside of Damascus, and I listen to EW10 Radio via podcasting, and I've just stumbled across this old interview you did with Barbara McWiggan and your wife, and I want to tell you that you're okay, but your wife is fantastic. <laughs> So I go running down the hall, and I grab my wife. I say, Jill, 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 St. Simeon the Stylite is alive and well, and he listens to EWTN. <laughs> um, okay, so another, another uh, accidental story of uh, Catholic radio. So, you know, the tagline of the show that we do is, what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? And we, we invite people to, uh, you know, to call in or write in. It's usually you know, Protestant polemics, you worship Mary, where is that in the Bible, how do I know there's a God, but every once in a while it gets a little more personal, and twice people have called in and said, you know, I'll tell you what's stopping me from becoming a Catholic, I've been listening to your show now for six months, and I can tell you with certainty what's stopping me from becoming a Catholic is you. <laughs> this has happened twice to me, all right, but it happened once about a month ago, or maybe three weeks ago. And it was a fascinating call because this fellow calls in and he says, you're what's stopping me from becoming a Catholic. It's idiots like you. He said that. He says, it's idiots like you who don't know the Bible. And he just tears into me with both feet, you know, just starts trying to rip me in half. And uh, this was one of the days when Tom usually is pretty good about getting these folks off the, off the radio pretty quick if they're vitriolic. But Tom was off, I think, in North uh, Dakota with Real Presence Radio, so I had him all by myself. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, what I did is I said, let's just, you know, let, let's keep the guy on. So I just kept asking him questions. And I really said very little, you know, about in, in, whereas, in the way of assertions. I just kept asking him to explain himself and trying to get him to clarify his thinking. And I, I stayed with him for six or seven minutes. And, you know, we finally got him on the hook, and then we, and then we let him go. Well, the interesting thing was, of all the, for the years that I've been doing this, that call generated more feedback than any other call we've ever had in the years and years we've been doing Catholic radio, in my experience. The next day, we had a, just a barrage of calls of people that called and said, that was my favorite part of the show, that was the favorite call I've ever heard. And, and one guy called in and said, after listening to that guy try to take you apart and just was filled with vitriol and hatred, I have decided to enter RCIA.
you want to talk about an accident. So in trying to take down the Catholic faith, this guy's attitude and disposition was such a negative witness that he chased somebody out of his own tradition into the Catholic Church. All right. Um, but I think my favorite call is, uh, and I no longer remember the guy's name, but he was in Mississippi. And he called in and he asked us just question after question after question. And finally, he just paused and he said, he said, look, I'm sorry for just barraging you with all these questions, but you guys are the only Catholics I know. You are the only Catholics I know. Now, uh, there's a Catholic sociologist named David Yamane who wrote a book in 2014 called Becoming Catholic, and it was a study of people in RCIA. And what Yamane found, and I, this conforms to my experience, is that most people who become Catholic, most people who become Catholic, become Catholic through their networks of family and friends, okay? In Yamane's study, at least in his, the diocese that he looked at, 87% of the people who were in RCA were there because of marriage. They were marrying a Catholic, okay? Um, and, uh, and so his conclusion was that most people, in his experience, don't come into the Catholic faith after a period of spiritual seeking. They stumble into it through, a, through, through networks and relationships. Now, when I became Catholic, I went and knocked on the door of the parish, met Monsignor Muller here in Birmingham, Alabama at Our Lady of Sorrows. I said, Father, I think I want to become a Catholic. And he said to me, well, you're either marrying a Catholic or you read your way in. I said, option B. Okay, now, that's true to my experience. That's the way most people come in. But uh, those ratios are unique to Catholicism. If you look at the data on, on conversion and religious switching throughout North America, you won't find any other religious community where the majority of their converts come in through marriage. Okay. Now, there's no bad reason to become a Catholic, and I'm very happy when people marry a Catholic and then come into the faith, but I found that my pastor's answer spoke to a real difficulty, a real pastoral problem in the church today, right? The difficulty is that Catholicism, quite frankly, is difficult to assimilate. It's an enormous body of material, catechetically speaking, right? The sacraments, the doctrines, the moral teaching, it's, it's, it's impressive, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, I mean, the, the intricacy of the faith is what draws so many of us to the church when we realize that there is really an answer to every human need, all right? But how do you communicate that winsomely? It's, a, it's not just an ideology or a book. It's an entire culture that's, in, that's endured for 2,000 years. How do you communicate the need and the beauty of that catechetically? It's objectively difficult, right, to do, I think. Um, and as my pastor's statement showed, there's a, there's a real... A lack of shallow entry, entry points into the faith. You know, what did he not say to me? He said, you married or you read your way in. He didn't say, well, obviously the Wednesday night evangelism group must have come and knocked on your door and invited you to church because he knew there was no Wednesday night evangelism group, all right? That there's a, that there's a, a lack of a pastoral expression where there's a genuine need, where there's a genuine need, all right? You know, my wife complained to me when I said, I want to become Catholic. She said, David, you read about this thing in books, Right? You, you, you have this idealized picture of Catholicism in your, in your mind, but that's not what it's life on the gr like, it's not what it's like on the ground. Trust me, I grew up Catholic. All right? and, and to a certain extent, that was a fair critique because her lived experience of Catholicism was shallow. That's why she left the church. That's why many people leave the church. In fact, if you ask, what's the number one people that, reason that people leave the church, they'll tell you it's because they didn't feel like their spiritual needs were being met. There wasn't somebody there to show them how to assimilate the riches of the tradition, all right? They didn't know. They didn't know. Nobody told them. Nobody taught them. There is a need. There's a catechetical lacuna, all right? And, you know, I was very happy when I went to Orlando, and many people from EW10 were there for the USCCV Convocation on Missionary Discipleship, because I think the bishops and the pope have spoken to this need to programmatically rethink the pastoral mission of the church in order to reach out to the peripheries and to touch people who aren't being touched, even those that are sitting in our pews that aren't being touched, okay? So I, I appreciate that, and I think we want to get on board with that and follow up that, that call to missionary discipleship. But I know, and you know, that there is a pastoral ministry of the church that has been meeting that need and filling that lacuna for 25 years. We are at 25, right? 1992, all right? And that's Catholic Radio. That's Catholic Radio. Catholic Radio has been meeting that need that, that uh, for, for whatever reason, parish and diocese haven't always been meeting in their normal pastoral efforts. And everywhere I go throughout the country, so many converts, so many converts to the Catholic faith through the ministry of Catholic Radio. Now, I want to shift gears. I'm a Reformationist. That's what brought me to the church, was studying the, the Reformation. You know, with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation right now, so a lot of that kind of stuff in the news. 
And uh, I gave a talk on the Reformation, why there was a Reformation. I want to share a few thoughts about that because it's relevant to what I'm doing here. Um, a lot of times when I get in front of a group I speak about the Protestant Reformation, I usually ask the question, why do you think there was a Reformation? Why did it happen? And generally speaking, it doesn't matter if I'm speaking to Protestants or Catholics, the answer that comes back is people will say, well, obviously it was because of all the corruption in the church. That's the, that's the typical answer that I get. And I'll say, well, that's interesting. Then why wasn't there a Reformation in the fourth century? You don't think there was corruption in the church in the fourth century? Gregory Nazianzus, who became the, uh, the uh, Bishop of Constantinople, Patriarch of Constantinople, didn't want the job. Why? Because of all the corruption in the church. If you've read the canons of the Council of Nicaea in 325, what do they deal with? Corruption in the church. All right. Look at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215. What did it try to address? Corruption in the church. Heck, just read the Bible. What do half the epistles want to deal with? Corruption in the church. Okay. If corruption in the church could explain the Reformation, we'd be having a Reformation every five minutes. Okay. So, you know, what, what, what I think, this is my own judgment as in my own historical study, what led to the Reformation was not so much the presence of corruption, but the, the change in attitude about the people towards corruption, all right? There was an ideology of reformism, of a, of, of a, of a desire for newness, all right, that was the fruit of what? Guess what? The Catholic Church. It was the mendicant orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, going out into the highways and the byways and preaching the gospel to people and trying to raise the level of spiritual awareness that created a spiritual hunger Right, in the people that wasn't necessarily being met by the standard pastoral ministries of the church at the time. All right? And I could I usually elaborate that thesis at, at great length when I give a public talk on it. All right? And of course, that's relevant to what we're doing today because I think the same dynamic that led to the Reformation, there was a, there was a pastoral lacuna. There was a failure to reach people with the gospel and to meet that spiritual need, meet that spiritual hunger. And that's what Catholic Radio is here to do. Now, there's another reason that I believe that corruption in the church indulgences, purgatory, penances, all that kind of stuff, the selling of those offices. Why I don't think that's a sufficient explanation for the Reformation. And the re that is because Luther himself, Martin Luther, said that his Reformation wasn't about that. In 1525, the Catholic humanist Erasmus of Rotterdam wrote a book attacking Luther, and it was on the freedom of the will. And Luther wrote a response in 1525 called On the Bondage of the Will defending his doctrine that, we, that humans don't have free will. And Luther says this. I want you to read, listen to the words of Martin Luther, the great Protestant theologian, founder of the Protestant Reformation. Luther says to Erasmus, he says, Erasmus, I greatly commend and I extol you for this thing, that you are the only man of all my antagonists who has attacked the heart of the subject, the head of the cause. Instead of wearing me out with all these extraneous points, which extraneous points? The papacy, purgatory, indulgences, and a number of like topics, which may more fitly be called trifles than matters of debate. That's fascinating, isn't it? Here's Luther. He says, the papacy, purgatory, indulgences, these things are trifles, not real matters of debate. That's not what this thing is about. Now, so, you want to know, what did Luther think the Reformation was about if it wasn't about indulgences and penances and purgatory and the papacy? Luther said the whole force of the Reformation was about one doctrine, one question. Can we cooperate with God's grace? Can we cooperate with God's grace? In some way different than the way a hammer cooperates with a carpenter, because he, he acknowledged that, all right? And Luther said, no, no. We cannot cooperate with God's grace. God does everything, we do nothing. But that was Luther's position, and that's the standard Protestant line. But of course, Scripture says differently. St. Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, says we are, God, we are God's co-laborers, as if Christ were making his appeal, or Christ's co-laborers, as if God were making his appeal through us. All right? The doctrine of our free cooperation with grace is a dogma of the faith. From the Council of Orange in 529 to the Council of Trent in 1547, the, ca the church has consistently taught that, yes, everything is from God's grace from start to finish. All right? It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus. No one comes to him but the Father draw you. But at the same time, the church also proclaims, yes, we can cooperate with God's grace. Our free participation makes a difference. It makes a difference. But that sets up for us a pastoral challenge. How then are we going to cooperate with God's grace? How will we bring others to cooperate with God's grace? 
Now, the most important way we can cooperate with God's grace is not in Catholic Radio. The most important way we can cooperate with God's grace is by uniting ourselves to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. My favorite passage from the Second Vatican Council is from Sacrosanctum Concilium, the dogmatic constitution on the sacred liturgy. And this is what the Council Fathers say about the laity. They should be instructed by God's word and be nourished at the table of the Lord's body. They should give thanks to God by offering the immaculate victim, not only through the hands of the priest, but also with him. They should learn also to offer themselves through Christ the mediator, they should be drawn day by day into an ever more perfect union with God and with each other, so that finally God may be all in all. The holy sacrifice of the mass is the source and summit of the Catholic faith, not only, not only because of the doctrine of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but because of the sublime truth that there at the table of, of the altar of the Lord's sacrifice, that we can join our lives, our sorrows, our sufferings, and our prayers together with the sacrifice of the, cro of the cross of Christ in the mass to the greater glory of God and our sanctification. That is the source of everything that we do. That is our deepest form of participation in the, in the Paschal mystery. From a human point of view, Catholic radio sometimes looks like a tremendous accident. Few of, or any of us intentionally sought out this ministry. It kind of fell to us. John 6, 44, no one comes to me except the Father draws him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. But we are God's co-laborers, as if God were making his appeal through us. We know that Catholic radio saves lives, saves marriages, saves families. Some of us have been called, like Tony, who was sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament, others at Holy Mass, others through a phone call, others through a casual acquaintance. In some unexpected way, God has called you to this ministry. The faith is hard to assimilate. It's difficult to live. It is a cross that the Lord tells us to asks us to take up. But we know how to cooperate with God's grace. He has given us the source and summit of our spiritual life, the fruitfulness of this ministry and every ministry. Catholic radio fills that pastoral gap it has been doing it for 25 years. It may be that you are the only Catholics they know. 15 years as an affiliate of the EWTN radio network. To Spirit Educational Association of Spring Valley, Illinois, with Jim Enger accepting on behalf of their... About 17 years ago, Circuit Judge Louis Jim Perona of Illinois was approaching retirement, wanted to do something. He was a man of great faith and uh, decided that it was going to be in radio. Problem was, the judge didn't know how to turn the radio on. <laughs> but that didn't stop him. Uh, he plugged ahead, and we had a lot of hard decisions to make. One decision that wasn't hard to make at all was Catholic Radio and EWTN. Uh, we uh, hit the transmitter switch and the computer switch and there was Catholic Radio. That was uh, 15 years ago and I can proudly say uh, we're still doing a good, uh, a good turn for the Catholic faith in the Illinois area in spite of the Illinois politicians. <laughs> Father... <laughs> You can only do so much. But he, if he were here, he'd be extremely proud but humble. And uh, I accept this for him. Thank you. And so this next award represents a significant milestone in Catholic radio. It is a 20-year award. And so... It's particularly unique tonight as we present this award because it's actually a double anniversary. This 20-year award goes to Covenant Network Catholic Radio, to Tony and Teresa Holman. But this also, yesterday, was actually their 20th wedding anniversary. So we celebrate both the 20th anniversary this year of Covenant Network as well as your 20th anniversary. So congratulations on your 20th anniversary. Please come up. Well, 
Well, thank you very much, Mike. I'd like to thank Doug Keck, Tom Price, Jack Williams. I mean, maybe not Jack. Uh, <laughs> and everybody at EWTN for everything you've done for us over the years. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Dennis Kelly, who was with us from the very beginning and put in, putting up with us all the years. And I'd especially like to thank our Lord for allowing us to do this stuff. Thank you very much. Never could play ragtime. Always wanted to play ragtime. Sir, sir, did you can play ragtime. Are we sure of this? Could you please come up here, Father Joseph, and uh, see what you can do on this thing? <laughs> Father Joseph, follow those colors. You see those colors? Oh, okay. Go with the colors. Okay. It's been a great joy to me and a, and a real affirmation to me to see, you know, so many, so many ways that people um, have committed their lives to Catholic radio. That's been an inspiration to me. We had no idea about anything about radio. We just felt this calling on our hearts. And I think that most people feel that same way, that really very few people are in Catholic radio that came from radio experience of any kind. And like I said, I think that's where God shines the most because he uses those of us where Mother Angelica also said God uses dodos. Well, that was certainly a job description that I could apply for. So I think it's just the willingness to be, to go out there and just go for it. And even if you don't know what you're doing, trust in God that he will provide if he wants you to do it and lead you along the way. And he does. And you have a lot of conversations with him <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> This is something that they never planned on doing. And yet they are doing it. And they make these incredible risks, each of which reminds me of Mother Angelica. The gift that she had of taking risks by all human standards because she trusted in Jesus Christ by the grace that she was given applies to the people I've met over the years. People are being called to Catholic Radio right now because God's talking to people through Catholic Radio. And I think Catholic Radio is reaching people because beyond that five or 10 minutes in a homily, if people aren't studying on their own, Catholic Radio is filling in that gap. And, and educating people, inspiring people. One of the things that Catholic Radio does is to reach out to people wherever they are and whatever the circumstances in their life in a very unique way, in a way that in many cases other media can't do. Almost uh, at least three times a week, I'll get someone who listened to my program or listened to someone else's program that says, Father, that's exactly what I needed at that particular moment. It was of God. It's that constant throwing the net out, throwing the net out of the, the Catholic message that I think is just intriguing to people. And every time I hear a story about somebody who stumbled onto it and then just became mesmerized by it, it just, it just feeds the fire in me of, okay, we're doing something good here. We're affecting lives, we're affecting souls, and there's nothing else that I could be doing that I know of that could be uh, affecting so many people. Do You know, I think Catholic Radio is really a great signpost to people of the direction back into the church. 
It's not an end unto itself, but it draws people back into the sacraments, into the life of the church. And so many times people who have been touched through Catholic Radio become so active in the church. They become the RCIA teachers or the catechist, but it builds more harvesters for the harvest, you might say. Each person I meet, I'm so blessed and thankful that God's brought them to us because they inspire me to, um, to keep up the fight every day. Great group of people, and they all love the Lord so much, and you can see it in their, in their eyes, and hear it in their voices, and in the excitement. And it doesn't matter what the cost is, or the price you have to pay, it's the fact that you get the word out that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Catholic Radio has had a tremendous impact along with EWTN television, in the way Catholics understand the faith. They hear that the truth proclaimed in love is what these people do. And so to me, it's the most wonderful way for people to reach out and to bring the love of God and the truth of God to people who are dying for that, literally. So we are the people who give hope to a world that needs a lot of hope. God is calling each of us in our own ways with the gifts and skills that he's given us to use those talents in his service and, and to take up this call. And the most important thing is to say yes to that. It is a privilege for me to share with you about Doug Pearson. I know in the group tonight, there are a lot of people who knew Doug Pearson. Uh, there's a lot of people tonight that did know Doug. So the, I want to give a little background on who Doug Pearson was and, uh, you know, which was the basis for this award. Um, you can see the picture of Doug. You only see his head. Um, Doug was six foot two, 225 pounds. He was a Marine. And uh, when he left the Marines, he went to work as a technician for AT&T. And in the year 2000, his life changed. First of all, he came into the Catholic faith. He was a convert. And that's when he got involved in Catholic radio. He started as a uh, operations manager for Immaculate Heart Radio in California. They were on the West Coast, and he actually lived with his family in Reno, Nevada. So he worked for Immaculate Heart Radio from 2000 to 2007. And um, by God's grace, in April of 2007, he came to work for the Guadalupe Radio Network. And that was shortly after we went into Dallas, Texas with two stations, one English, one Spanish. And, you know, again, by God's grace, he was there to help us go into other major markets. We went into San Antonio, Washington, D.C., and Houston, Texas. And uh, he, he, he was such a blessing to the GRN. And as Michael shared, he was also a blessing to a lot of other radio apostolates. His goal was to get as many Catholic radio stations on the air as possible. So he would, you know, in his extra time, help other apostolates that needed operational help or build-outs. And a lot of the apostolates here uh, tonight were built out as a result of D Doug's involvement and help. And so those were the three areas in between starting in 2000, where he was involved in Catholic Radio, Immaculate Heart Radio, Guadalupe Radio Network, and a lot of the apostolates here tonight. On a more personal note, in September of 2014, just three years ago, uh, he was diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer. And nine months later, June 25th, 2015, he passed away. Just nine months, it went so quickly. And uh, 
You know, there's several of the Guadalupe Radio Network employees here tonight, and it was a tough period for us to watch him. Uh, his whole demeanor, work style just changed because of the suffering he was going through. And uh, like I said, on June 25th, 2015, he passed away at the age of 50. And uh, he left behind his beautiful wife, Tricia, nine kids, and 11 grandkids. And uh, I wanted to share with you two sentences from the obituary that uh, his family wrote about him, about him and his life. Just two sentences. It was a very lengthy obituary, but two, ver two of those sentences really stood out to me. And they are as follows. Though Doug's final months of life were mer marked by great suffering, his most earnest prayer intention through it all was that he would seek to embrace the will of God rather than simply accept it. In his life and his death, Doug was a profound witness to what it means to take up your cross and follow and fight for Jesus. As you can tell from his, family word, his family's words and feelings, Doug was definitely a warrior about the faith. And so, you know, I want to thank EWTN, Michael, for creating this word to recognize a true warrior of the faith, Doug Pearson, who we love and miss very much. And so it is with uh, great pride that I announce that the recipients of the 2017 Doug Pearson Faithful Warrior Award are Tony and Teresa Holman of Covenant Radio Network. I just want to express, first of all, my thanks to CWTM because really, truly, when we came here 16 years ago, we realized we had no plan, no clue what we're doing, but it seemed like a good idea. Um, then everyone pointed, once we bought the station, they said, well, now what are we going to do? And they said, Ron, just, it's your idea. Do you do it? And okay, so for the first 13 years, we ran it out of my house. And uh, now we're up to five stations. But the amazing part was, <laughs> Doug Pearson knew the situation. He goes, what are you doing for your share -thons? And I said, uh, you're probably, what are you, taking calls at the uh, coffee table in the living room? And I said, the living room. We're in the dining room. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Jerry Usher would come by, and actually it was a great place to do his laundry. So it worked out great. <laughs> One of the reasons we uh, ended up moving out, too, is as we were growing, and we're up to five sta four stations, and it was quite the ultimate man cave, um, having, having that in your house. But uh, all of a sudden, station by station was going off the air. And uh, then my daughter would come down, and they'd come back on the air. And then she went upstairs, and they're all going off. And, honey, what are you doing up there? Oh, I'm Skyping my friends. You're just sucking all the bandwidth out of here. <laughs> Get off that. <laughs> so anyway, with limited bandwidth, we kind of put that by. Now we're in some real uh, building space. But uh, I just want to express once again our gratitude uh, for all your prayers. And uh, just to let you know, anyone can do this. This is uh, really an honor to be up here. And so thank you very much. It's great to have all of you here and our choir. Catholicism has presented the faith in Jesus Christ. But that faith in Christ and hope for eternal life has been absolutely incredible in its ability to inspire a love of beauty. I always oftentimes think about how uh, berserkers, you know what a berserker is? Any of you know berserkers? No, no, most people don't. These were Gothic warriors 
who used to go crazy in battle, but they've been forgotten. Instead, we remember Gothic cathedrals. The faith trained or transformed the berserkers into people who built beauty. And instead of the war cries of our barbarian ancestors, of so many of us, absolutely stupendous music was able to be composed, inspired by love of Christ. And we are, we are at a time where in order to relate to people, some of our church music has been dumbed down and made, I would say, fairly egotistical. I oftentimes describe the hymns that we have in modern hymnals as being group narcissism. <laughs> we are the people of God. We are the light of the world. We are building this. We are gathering together. All, But one of the great things about our choir and the director is that the music that is truly beautiful focuses on praising God, not ourselves. <laughs> and tonight we have the opportunity for a piece of beautiful religious music that will uplift us precisely because it focuses on God, our Lord. 